Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our God is the God who gives wisdom to us. Our sermon text for today will be the epistle lesson from James chapter 3 and 4. Uh, I want to begin by, by asking you a question. If um, you could uh, make a list of, of, of the worst decisions that this world has ever seen, what would you put on that list? Worst decisions, biggest mistakes, what would you put on that list? Um, there, was, there was one, uh, a couple of years a little more lighthearted, but uh, th- there, there was one, um, a man named uh, Dick Rowe, he was a person who was big in the music field, and he was one who's kind of booked bands and all this stuff. And there was a band who came before him, and they were called uh, the Silver Beatles. And he listened to them, and he said, you know what? I don't think guitar music is ever going to catch on, and these guys have a bad sound. I'm going to pass. Then, like, four months later, they changed their name to the Beatles, and they became the biggest rock group ever, and they changed the landscape of music. That was a mistake. Um, there was also a mistake, um, the people who were driving the Titanic, um, instead of, uh, going, uh, right into the iceberg, they thought that it'd be better if they could, um, travel around the iceberg, um, which then didn't end so well, and then it led to a movie that also wasn't so good either, and so <laughs> that was a big mistake. Um, there, uh, was, oh, there's a, one other good one. Oh, there, there was, um, 12 companies who passed on the Harry Potter book genre. They passed on all those book sequels, and, and now it's the largest selling book and movie of all time, and has made billions and billions, whatever. Um, there was 12 companies that passed on it. Big mistake. Um, from history, we know that um, Napoleon had one of the largest armies, about 600,000 people, and he marched his troops um, up through Russia, and because of the very harsh winters, and actually because lice went through his um, troops, he went from 600,000 to 100,000, from one of the largest armies ever assembled to um, not being that. That was a mistake to keep trekking up and up through Russia. One of the biggest ones from my childhood um, that brought me a lot of joy was that the um, Houston Rockets and the Portland Trailblazers in the NBA passed on Michael Jordan in the 1984 NBA draft. And so the Chicago Bulls selected him third overall, which was my favorite team, and I was outside Chicago, and I just adored Michael Jordan. So that was a mistake for them, good for me. But there's plenty of mistakes. What would you put on that list? What would you put? Even more importantly, what would you put on a list of your personal biggest mistakes. And then from that, what has been the biggest decisions that you've made in your life? And how have you made them? A lot of open-ended questions that we're going to be working through of how the life of a Christian looks at it, and what we believe, and how God works through these um, decisions that we make. What is the biggest decision you've made. Maybe, maybe it's been um, whether or not to get married, or whether to have kids, or what job you were going to take, or what city you were going to settle down in um, if you're moving tomorrow. All these things, you have different ways of making these decisions. In the Bible, um, we have certain books, uh, they're called wisdom literature. We have a lot of them in the Old Testament. Um, Psalms and Proverbs, a Song of Solomon is kind of like that. We have a couple others, but they're considered wisdom literature. In the New Testament, we have James um, as a very clear wisdom literature, which means that the book isn't as much about telling us um, about what Christ has done for us and how God is reconciling himself to his people, but instead it is a lot more practical wisdom in which we can learn from. And so as Christian people, we know that we always begin um, with the justification part. We, we always begin with the fact of that we are loved by God and that he continues to preserve and sustain his church and that we are his children. We are justified before God on account of the work of Jesus Christ. But also that we live a life in the many vocations that God has placed us at work, at home, in our communities, in our families, in our friends, in all these ways, in all these arenas that he has put us. 
And this sanctification, this, this process of, of conforming ourselves to the will of God, the process of the Holy Spirit, this Christian walk in which we're on, what we are to do and how we are to live is what this wisdom literature gets more at. So, of course, as Christians, we begin with how we are justified, how we are loved by God, but then from that, too, it's okay for us to talk about how we are to live, what we are to do, because Scripture speaks on it, so we need to speak on it. James gets at that. James talks a lot, at, about, a lot about it, and he pits these two things against each other. He talks about in earthly wisdom— and a heavenly wisdom. These two different things. Here's what, what he says about earthly wisdom. This is how he describes it. He says, it is, uh, I'll let you decide whether which, one, which one's the right one. Earthly wisdom is uh, bitter jealousy, strife, disorder, foul deeds, quarrels, fights, covetousness. Not so great. All this earthly wisdom is in, is in no short supply in this world. We see it present in our world, in our congregations, these pews, in our families, in our synod, on our blogs, on our videos, on our social media. But most troubling, we find all this earthly wisdom, all this sin, all these bad things in each and every one of our hearts. We also find it there. But this heavenly wisdom, this heavenly wisdom that, that God gives and supplies, this is how it's characterized. Paul, uh, or James says this. He says, The wisdom that comes down from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. James then goes on to say, uh, in our reading for today, he says, therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God, for you cannot love the world and love God. He's not saying we, we are to detach from the world or from the life where God has placed us, but he is saying that this earthly wisdom, this earthly matter, is not greater but instead is to serve the heavenly wisdom that God gives to us. There are two kinds of wisdom. One is from above, one is below. One is peaceful, one is envious and jealous. So the life of the Christian, we turn to this means. To get this heavenly wisdom, we turn to God, and we go to his word, reading and meditating on his words. We consistently partake of his sacraments, reminding ourselves of our baptism and coming to the Lord's Supper. And we go to him in prayer laying our problems and our thanks at his feet. But even with, even with his word, even with the sacraments, even with going to God in prayer, there are still decisions that we have to make in our lives. We don't always see our prayers answers, and the questions remain for each and every one of us about relationships, new jobs, moving, finances— what we're to do, so on and so forth. The questions still remain in the life of the Christian. They're not all spelled out for us easy hunky-dory in Scripture. So looking at James, I think, I think he orients and he turns us towards a simple way in which we are to, to make a decision based in light of our faith. I think that first we question, and then we leap, and we take action and then finally, we rest in God. We question, we leap, take a direction, and then finally we rest. We'll walk through these. Uh, when, when, when we question something, we, we need to examine our hearts first. In the life of a Christian, we, we need to get to the point to where we realize that ultimately I am not in control of my life. God is. The work of my hands and the direction of my feet are put forward by Him. He is the one directing our steps, directing our path. He is the creator. We are the created being. He is the potter. We are the clay. We begin by acknowledging who he is and who we are. And then we confess our fears about the worst possible scenario. What may happen in light of this? We'll talk more about the comfort that God gives us in those scenarios towards the end. But when we question we need to first go to God, as we talked about, 
in his word and his sacraments and prayer, but we also need to invite wisdom from others, invite wisdom from those we know and those who know Jesus. We need to get wisdom from people who know us well, family, friends, people who have our best interests involved, people who know us very well, people who aren't afraid to tell you what you need to hear. And then from that, in all of our big decisions, we need to consult and to talk to people who know Christ. Hopefully these people are one and the same, but if they're not, that's okay too. But we need to talk to people who know Christ. People who aren't afraid to speak his word into our life even when we don't want to hear it. People who are bold in their proclamation of Christ and people who want to keep pointing you back to the cross of Jesus Christ and have you never abandoned it. Brothers and sisters in Christ are to support and love one another, to counsel each other, to bring them up when they are grieving, to laugh when they laugh, and to cry when they cry. The body of Christ, as we just saw, the holy ark of the Christian church, the boat in which we are on together, supporting, loving, and encouraging one another as we look to follow Christ. Invite wisdom from others and invite wisdom from people who know Christ which may be a person who doesn't look anything like you, a pe- person who's a totally different age than you, but a person who knows Christ and their opinion is important when making a decision. We question, and then we leap. We act. We make a choice. Psalm 119, 105 says, Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. Beautiful, beautiful verse. Word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. But he's not saying that it's going to be easy. You're not always going to see the road clearly. What the psalmist is actually using um, in this um, kind of characterization in Psalm 119 is a picture of an ancient oil lamp. This ancient oil lamp wouldn't have been lit and it had one tiny little flame on the end. Wouldn't have lit up that much. It was a tiny little flame. It was not bright. So it is when we come to God with our decisions. He doesn't promise that he's going to show us exactly what we need to do at exactly the right times, and everything is going to be lit up exactly as it should be, and there's just, of course we're going to go this way. Instead, by his word, a lamp to our feet and a light on my path, he gives us the light of his will, of his law, and what we are to do. He's not saying he's going to tell us exactly what but he will give us a light. It's kind of like, uh, you know when you go camping um, and uh, you wake up in the middle of the night and you realize that you're in a tent, and which isn't a good idea, but you wake up and then you're like, I have to go walk to the bathrooms, right? And so you, you got to, you know, crawl out of your tent and you just have that tiny little flashlight and you got to get to those really gross bathrooms really far away. <laughs> you're walking and you just have the flashlight. You can't see very much. You don't know exactly where you're going. You are surrounded by darkness. You're surrounded by unfamiliar territory. You are surrounded by who knows what is lurking in the bushes. But you just have the small light. Enough light to get through that very next step. Enough light to just continue to keep going until you make your destination. So it is with God's word. He doesn't tell us exactly where we need to go. He doesn't tell us the whole grand picture. But he gives us his promises. He gives us his word, just that small light to keep us going, to put one foot in front of the other, to continue to trust him. Because the light is the trust that he will not go back on his promises and that he will continue to be with us through everything. It's just a small light. But it is a light that pierces the darkness. When we make a decision, we have to pick a way. We have to, we have to, we have to choose something. And the road may be dark, but there is light for that very next step. It is a walk of faith where God is leading you, where he is always directing your steps. So finally, we rest. We have questions, we have decided, and finally, after we've made a decision, a big decision, we rest. We rest in the goodness that God has proven to us on the cross and the empty tomb of Jesus Christ. Philippians 4, 6-7 says, And do not be anxious about anything, but I I love this, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, supplication, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. 
And the peace of God which transcends, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. He's saying, bring your prayers before God, but ultimately, rest in his peace. Do not be anxious over the prayers that you give before God. For he knows them, and he knows you. Rest in his promises, for God always gives what he promises. He always promises that he will give forgiveness to those who repent. There is no situation, no context, no person who comes to God for his forgiveness, and God says, no, 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 not this time, not this time. There is always forgiveness for one who repents. We always have the forgiveness. And we always have wisdom. If you don't believe me, I have a verse to back me up. James 1, 5 through 6. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. Seeking wisdom, God wishes to give it to us. Not that earthly wisdom that we were talking about, but the heavenly wisdom of peace and gentleness. God promises to rescue. He promises always to rescue, even when we make the worst decisions. He rescues in the sense that he will not separate us from his love. And even more, there's no situation that cannot work for his glory or his good, even if we don't see it in the short term. God uses us, and he uses our situations. Because ultimately, God promises to resurrect all of us, those who believe in his name. So if we go through that that worst-case scenario, all those steps of what is the worst possible thing that could happen with me making this decision, we go through all the steps and we make a decision, even in confidence, and it totally falls apart, and it totally turns out to be the worst decision that you've ever made in your whole life, and maybe you even go to your deathbed with regret over this decision that you have made. There is still forgiveness. There is still love from God, whether it be something silly like passing on the Beatles or not drafting Michael Jordan or having people stuck in Russia. There is still forgiveness for all of our decisions. By your faith in Christ, you will be resurrected with him, which doesn't diminish this life or the work in which we do in it, but instead it points us to the ultimate hope in which we have in Christ. When we are in our Savior's arms, when we are in eternity with him, so beautiful before his never-ending presence, that even our worst decisions that we have made will fall away, that our slate will be made clean, and that we will be blameless before God in his presence. We can rest. We can relax. Because there is forgiveness in Christ and a hope eternal. We can relax. There is rest for those in Christ, for he gives us his forgiveness. Therefore, we submit ourselves to God. We, we, we look for the heavenly wisdom that brings peace and understanding over the worldly that seeks to destroy. What, what is the worst thing that has ever happened in our world's history? Back to my original question. The worst decision of all time was our falling into sin. Our decision to press away from God, to sever ourselves away from him, to be disconnected. It's a bad decision. It's an earthly decision. And though that bad decision begins our Bible, just a few pages in, it begins our story, it does not end there. Because the rest of the story, culminating in Jesus Christ, the story that is still being written today, is God fixing that mistake. It is God fixing the boneheaded decisions. God is righting a wrong. He is working beauty out of a bad beginning. So why would he not do the same with each and every one of us? When we make a bad decision, why would there not be forgiveness in those moments? There's always grace, forgiveness, and wisdom for the people of God. Question yourself with the aid of others. Make a leap with your faith, and finally just rest in God. Find that peace beyond all understanding with God, because afterwards we can ask when it's all done, what really do I have to lose? What really do I have to lose if I am a child of God? If he is holding me firmly in his hand and he is drawing me closer to himself, what can I lose? For all we have is God's and all we are is God's.
a love unimaginable. We have freedom in this life to make decisions, tough choices, so we seek to glorify, glorify God through them, for his love will never leave us. Hebrews 4.16 says, Therefore let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Amen.